afternoon, dear friends and colleagues. Um, it is really an honor uh, to share in this prestigious meeting of the Vidratna Society of India. And we'd like to thank the organizing committee, Dr. Gridhar and Dr. Vishali for, and uh, the rest of the organizing committee for their generous invitation. We're really proud of being friends um, of the Vitretna Society of India, speaking on behalf of the Egyptian Vitretna Society. And um, we are now going to conduct the symposium about innova innovations in vitretinal surgery. And the first speaker um, on our list is Dr. Ahmed Abdelhadi from Alexandria University. And he's going to speak about new sutureless illuminated macular buckle designed for myopic macular hole retinal detachment. Dr. Ahmed. Uh, can I have that? Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for this chance. Uh, this is um, an idea we had, uh, and we published this paper uh, together with myself and uh, Dr. Professor Veda, who will hopefully be here, but wouldn't be. Uh, with the revival of the macular buckle, a lot of people use the macular buckle for macular hole retinal detachment and myopic maculopathies, but why sutureless? Why did you think it should be a sutureless uh, uh, technique? Because a lot of people who have performed sclera buckling or macular buckling or uh, conventional macular buckling, when they had to uh, hang the recti, they saw this grayish area in the scleras, which is very thin areas and very difficult to take sutures in, and you, uh, you could get uh, su suprachoroidal hemorrhage or even in, uh, intravitreal hemorrhage if you get to take sutures uh, by this technique. So how to fix the buckle without sutures? We used it from the tissue adhesive from dermatology, histoacryl glue, steroid liquid topical adhesive, and this is uh, a blue color can identify the thin film of fluid put on the sclera outside. And this is supplied in 0.5 millimeter single use sterile ampoules, um, plastic. Uh, this remains in a liquid form until exposed to acid base, alcohol, or water, or water containing substances, for example, tissues. Histoacryl polymerizes exothermically when it is heated by the tissue, by the heat of the body, and forms a film that bonds to the underlying tissues. The macular buckle itself is uh, prepared by uh, stuff which is already present in the OR, cheap uh, things like the 276 tire and the 507 sponge. First of all, we uh, take a 9 millimeter part of the tire, this is it, and we a 3 millimeter part of the terminal 507 sponge, this is the part, then we split the into two halves, this is the two halves, and then we uh, fix the sponge to the tire. This is after the, the tire has been uh, uh, made, and then we uh, perform a tunnel in the external surface of the tire by a 18 gauge needle, where we pass the fiber optic light, and this is the tire, the, the illuminated uh, macular buckle uh, after the fiber optic light is on. Then we expose the inferior oblique, the superior oblique, then the superior temporal quadrant is uh, exposed in a left eye and superior. Uh, and this, we perform a paracentesis to decrease the interocular pressure of the uh, eye so that we can manipulate it externally. Then, revising the anatomy, the macular buckling of for myopic macular hole uh, paper 2012 in the retina by Dr. Siam et al., where he uh, explained that exposing the inferior edge of the inferior oblique will point us to, towards the transverse long posterior ciliary artery, and this is the external anatomical mark for the macula. So after uh, identification of the temporal long posterior artery along the inferior border of the inferior oblique, we uh, simply put the uh, uh, tire uh, along this landmark, and then we apply a thin adhesive uh, externally. Uh, of course, after identification of the head of the buckle uh, below the macula, simply by using the biome by and turning on the fiber optic lights. And this is a short video how the buckle is being prepared by suturing the 507 sponge to the tire, and then by hang exposing the recti. This is the transverse long posterior ciliary artery, as is very evident here. Then by forming a tunnel along the posterior surface of the tire, putting the fiber optic light, and then uh, passing it to the external surface of the glue. We only perform this buckle with no vitrectomy. This is, for example, some of our cases, since it's retinal detachment without a macular hole, and this is preoperative OCT. 
uh, this is before surgery, uh, one day after buckle with gas, uh, SF6, and this is uh, one day after surgery of also. In the early cases, we performed it with gas, but later on, we put only air. One day after the buckling, uh, most of the fluid is gone, and uh, we can see the change of the configuration of the posterior surface of the globe from a concave to a convex configuration. Uh, three months after, uh, later, where the wider retina is still attached, and we notice some uh, corrugations in the Brooks membrane because of the indenting effect of the buckling. Again, this, this case before surgery, one day after buckling, three months after uh, later, and the buckle is still there. A myopic macular hole retina attachment, which is the major uh, concern here, one day after surgery with air, the retina, the subretinal fluid is nearly absor totally absorbed, one week after surgery, and uh, again four months after surgery with the patient stable and the vision uh, improving. Uh, again, this case, one week, after, one, week after, one week after surgery, one month after surgery, and four months after surgery. We can see here that the indenting effect of the buckle weans with time, but this does not affect its uh, end result. Myopic fulvous kisses, we can use all the myopic kisses. We all know uh, how difficult surgery is in myopic fulvous kisses and uh, how these retinas respond very uh, poorly to ILM peeling or to surgery itself. This is a case of myopic fulvous kisses affecting the vision. Uh, with the follow-up of the patient, the vision of the patient dropped down. So we applied uh, simply a macular buckle without doing a vitrectomy and air, and 10 days after surgery, the fulvous kisses. Two months after surgery, and this is the indenting effect of the buckle, and we can see here compression of the retinal layers at the macula uh, and residual fulvous kisses along uh, both sides of the head of the buckle. Before surgery, uh, 10 days after surgery, and again two months after surgery. Another case of myopic fulvous kisses before surgery and after 10 days after surgery. Um, and this is one month after surgery and two months after surgery. Uh, a case where the patient uh, lost follow up, he came uh, uh, during the month of September 2015 with an impending macular hole. He developed the hole uh, three months later after putting the buckle two weeks only. The retina was reposited, uh, the hole was not closed uh, with some restoration of the visual acuity. Uh, this is a case of recurrent retina detachment after uh, vitrectomy and silicon. We remove the silicon oil simply, and then uh, this is before surgery, and then uh, one week after surgery, applying the buckle, putting uh, uh, gas, and the patient was the patient was repulsed, and he improved the vision improved. But this bu uh, buckle is not without complications. We can have, for example, in this myopic fulvous cases, subhyaloid hemorrhage because uh, working on such hypotenuse eyes might have supracoroidal hemorrhage, and this uh, surgery, uh, to our luck, one day after surgery, and the patient this blood began to absorb from the fovea mainly, and the visual acuity improved 10 days later, and this is 20 days later, and one month, uh, one and a half months later, the, the gap was completely resolved. This is two months after surgery, so before surgery, and 10 days after surgery, with the buckle in place. The buckle was not perfectly under the foveola, but the vision improved uh, with the absorption of blood from the foveola. Here, before surgery, with a vitromacular adhesion and the fovius cases, uh, 10 days after surgery, and 30 days after surgery with complete reposition and disappearance of the fovius cases from the uh, central part of the macula. And this is three months after surgery. Here it is clearly evident how the denting effect of the buckle weans with time, but the patient uh, does uh, and uh, continues to uh, uh, do better. Muscle tear can happen because sometimes this is inferior oblique muscle while we're hanging the inferior oblique. You can see here the inferior oblique is lost. And actually in this case, we did not uh, try to find the inferior oblique and nothing happened to the patient, no uh, deleterious uh, um, uh, diplopias or anything. In conclusion, uh, preparation of the buckle is simple and easy uh, from easily available materials, cheap in the OR, and elimination helps to ensure the proper placement under the foveola. We can readjust the place because this histoacryl tissue adhesive uh, which is very effective in keeping the buckle in place, doesn't polymerize or doesn't uh, become firm except after 20 seconds. So we can readjust the position even after we apply the tissue adhesive. And indenting effect is long lasting, however, it decreases with time, but this doesn't affect the final outcome of the buckle. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. The next presentation will be by Professor Hassan Murtada about our IM envelope technique in myopic macular hole retinal detachment. Well, we have seen the use of a macular buckle in management of um, 
pathology occurring in the posterior staphylomen. And now this is another technique that I propose, um, the use of the ILM envelope technique, which is a modification of the ILM um, flap. Let us have a look on this case. This is a case of a recurrent retinal detachment due to a myopic macular hole retinal detachment. The axial length of this eye is 34.2 millimeter, and this eye had um, a spheral buckle long time ago. So um, after staining of the internal limiting membrane using brilliant blue, the flaps are created, and the flaps are created from all the directions not only creating flaps, but the internal limiting membrane is removed over the whole area of the staphyloma, knowing that the internal limiting membrane is the stiffest part of the retina. So we have to remove the internal limiting membrane. We have created a flap under PFCL, and then the um, uh, eye lamp flaps is brought over the macular hole. This is the pre-operative picture with the macular hole, and this is a macular hole following development of retinal detachment, and this is the post-operative picture, just one month following the um, uh, application of the um, envelope uh, eye lamp flap, the retina is attached, and this eye in particular, I filled it with silicon oil because this is the last eye of this patient, and um, this is on December 2017. The visual acuity improved to 0.6. What is important is the restoration of the outer retina so that you can see the external limiting membrane and the ellipsoid zone, and that is explain why vision improved in these cases. This is another case, and you have, as you have seen, uh, Brilliant Blue is injected under fluid and not under air. And this here, it is different from the previous case where the fluid fills only the posterior staphyloma. In the previous case, it was a total retinal detachment. Again, as you see, we, the eye lamp is peeled um, towards the macular hole and stopping about 500 microns from the edge of the macular hole. And we try to peel the internal limiting membrane over the whole area of the staphyloma. Here is a large flap that will be brought over the macular hole. And um, the important thing is not to use uh, PFCL while doing the uh, peeling because in these cases the contrast is poor and attaching the retina will eliminate this contrast. This is the preoperative picture um, and this is the postoperative picture one month postoperatively the air has absorbed and the visual acuity improved to 0.3 with the retina attached. Again, five months post-operatively, the vision improved to 0.6 with restoration of the structure of the outer retina. And again, I should emphasize that I'm using air and not gas. In this case, I could not remove the internal limiting membrane under without the use of PFCL because it was strongly adherent to the underlying retina. That's why I injected um, PFCL to stabilize the retina and help in uh, attaching the, the uh, in peeling the internal limiting membrane. You can see that the macular hole is a huge and large um, macular hole with a huge diameter. And I thought of, of treating this patient by the use of autologous retinal flap, but I decided to try first the internal li in limiting membrane flaps and the case, um, the, the macular hole was closed and the vision improved to 0.16. So if we compare between the ILM peel and remove and ILM peel and invert, we find that the anatomical outcome while the retina was attached in both groups, but the macular hole closure could be achieved in two of the 13 cases that is 15%, so the hole remained open, the hole remained flat but open, and with the eye lamp peel and invert the envelope technique, we could achieve 100% retina reattachment and 100% closure. What about the visual outcome? The visual improvement in the visual acuity by one or more lines occur in the peel and remove 
in 61%, but in 100% of the cases with the envelope technique. And with the peel and invert technique, there is progressive improvement in the visual acuity because of the restoration of the outer retina. So to conclude, envelope technique should be preferred procedure in all myopic macular whole retinal detachment. It is associated with 100% flat closure of the macular hole and retina reattachment, and it is associated with restoration of the ellipsoid zone and external limiting membrane in approximately 60% of cases. Peeling of the rigid internal limiting membrane to the edge of the staphyloma, relieving tangential fraction, increasing the retinal flexibility and reattachment, confirmed placement of the internal limiting membrane over the a macular hole because you are bringing the flaps from all directions. And this helps to um, act as a scaffold for Muller cell proliferation and photoreceptor migration. And there is no chance for reinversion of the internal limiting membrane. So it, uh, you are sure that the flap is over the macular hole and this is associated with the 100% closure. Thank you for your attention. Next presentation will be by Professor Shrit Mbavi about autologous neurosensor retinal graft and pre island flap. Okay, once again, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Indian Vitreton Society for the invitation of the uh, EGVRS, the Egyptian Vitreton Society, and uh, I extend the invitation to the uh, Vitreton Society of India uh, to welcome us in uh, our annual meeting in 2020 that will be held in Aswan from the 1st to the 3rd of April. Uh, two years time. So we really cherish this collaboration and hope it stays uh, for, for a long, long time. So I'm gonna just uh, extend uh, um, uh, the, the theme that we're talking about, management of uh, retinal detachment uh, in high myopic patients with posterior staphyloma. So usually retinal detachment in high myopic patients is, uh, with posterior staphyloma is commonly due to a single uh, central macular hole as shown uh, by uh, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Hassan Murtada. However, sometimes we discover intraoperatively in such situations a different scenario. Sometimes there is a central macular hole and another macular break, uh, or there is no macular hole with one or more small back, uh, breaks near the arcades that are discovered intraoperatively because sometimes they are so tiny that you cannot see them preoperatively. Sometimes the break is nasally, peripapillary or juxtapillary break, slit beside the optic disc, and sometimes it can be a combination of a macular hole and other breaks. We always have to look for other breaks. Now, the closure of such non-macular breaks uh, uh, depends on the location. If they are central, maybe you can try an inverted island flap and also island flap uh, uh, peeling in my myopic patients is very difficult, very challenging. Or a free graft, island graft, or an autologous retinal transplant. If it is near the arcades or uh, with an RPE either, you can laser treatment. And there is the recent described uh, technique by Rizu that you can use an amniotic membrane plug. So this is just an example of a patient that I thought it was a macular hole. This is a patient, highly myopic patient, with a central uh, macular uh, uh, detachment uh, up to the uh, uh, posterior staphyloma with, with no preferred extension. So after uh, doing uh, staining with tramsinone, which is a routine in such cases, because usually there is vitreous cases, and then I discovered that there is a small slit break uh, just at the upper arcade. Now, you stain for the, uh, to, to peel the ILM, and here I can detect that there is a small slit at the upper vascular uh, arcade. Of course, trying to peel the ILM, now you can see that the dye is coming. Some, of course, we don't like the dye to go underneath the retina, but sometimes it can be the guide to tell you where is exactly the break, because sometimes you cannot detect because of lack of contrast. Peeling the ILM outside the arcade sometimes is very challenging in normal eyes and even more challenging in highly myopic eyes. So I attempted once and twice and thrice, and uh, uh, the, I couldn't really peel the ILM in that case. So I was hoping that I can invert the ILM. Staining again, I can discover, again, despite I, uh, I peeled, uh, I stained with Tramsin alone, you can see another layer, actually, and it, I, it showed to be another layer of the posterior heart that was extending up to the, to the periphery. So these highly myopic patients can have anomalous posterior hyaloid and anomalous uh, ILM. So luckily enough, th this patient, uh, uh, I was not able to peel the ILM, so I decided to uh, uh, do a small peripheral retinotomy outside the staphyloma, Okay, and then I, did, I put peripheral carbon, and this patient, I did laser treatment uh, uh, at the retinotomy, and again at this small tiny slit there, 
uh, and uh, it, it did work in, in, that, in that patient. And this is at the time of uh, silicon oil removal, uh, the, the retina was uh, dry. So again, you can find uh, uh, breaks at the arcades. So this is the OCT of the patient postoperatively. So another scenario in this case, this is a patient that had uh, not one macular, it has two macular holes. You can see that there is one over there in the center and another one just nasal to it. And there was another one also at the lower arcade. Now, again, in that patient, peeling of the ILM was very difficult. So it's not always uh, uh, easy as in, in normal eyes. Again, the posterior hyaloid, you can see very thick, very adherent. Sometimes you may need a forceps to remove the posterior hyaloid in such highly myopic patients. So again, the challenge again is to peel the ILM. In that patient, I would, was not able to invert, but I managed to peel the ILM up to the uh, edge of the staphyloma. But uh, now I have to put something on the hole. So I use this piece of ILM, which was a large piece, as a, a free flap to cover the two holes, the central one and the one that is nasal to it. And I put a small one actually at the lower uh, break at near the arcade, and I supplemented the uh, peripheral uh, one with uh, additional uh, laser. Uh, so a free flap can work in those patients, and this is the post-operative OCT of the central macula. So a free flap is another option. Now, the concept of autologous retinal transplant, which was introduced by Tamar Mahmoud in 2016, uh, despite uh, some uh, skepticism about it, but it does work in many cases of uh, macular holes. And I use them in many cases of uh, macular hole retinal detachments, not without detachment, with detachment. This was one of those cases in which I failed to peel the ILM and I used a free flap to uh, 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 close this macular hole in that highly myopic patient as with posterior staphyloma. And uh, again, despite uh, I was not able to peel the ILM at all in that patient, this patient, I managed to close the macular hole and even remove the silicon oil with an attachment. So that you can move the flap under the PFO up to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the hole, and then uh, I do a direct perfluorocarbon uh, silicon uh, uh, exchange. So again, here's closure of the hole, okay, and, direct, uh, and then uh, silicon oil, and again, this actually the picture was one day post-operative, and I removed the silicon oil and stayed fine. And they do regain some central vision, those patients, with a vision of 0.2 in this patient was achieved. So the, since the concept of ART is there, how about if we can use it in non-macular breaks? So this is a single eye patient that came to me actually with hypotony and uveitis and choroidal detachment with a total detachment uh, of the retina, as you can see. Again, inspecting the macula, there wasn't any macular holes. Again, I noticed that there was a small slit, just nasal to the disc, a very small slit. And that was the reason of the retinal detachment. Again, the posterior hyaloid was, was always really elusive in those patients, and you have to look for them, and you have to stain and stain until you are 100% sure, because if you don't remove the posterior hyaloid completely, this failure will be doomed. Again, there was a, a little bit of element of PVR, but again, staining for the uh, uh, for island peeling. I even, again, try to peel the island nasally. It's very difficult once you are outside the arcades in highly myopic patients. Again, the dye can sometimes be the clue where the, uh, uh, the, 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 the hole is. Uh, of course, there's concern of toxicity, but again, it can help you to detect these slight thin uh, slits that can be in sometimes invisible. Again, in, the, in that patient, okay, how I close the hole, I cannot laser it because it's just abutting the, the, the optic disc. So in this case, again, using the same concept of autologous retina transplant, I had a piece of a retina from the peripheral retina and just swiped it under the peripheral carbon right into the area of the uh, 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 diesel break without doing any thermal uh, pexy to, to, to the retina. And I doing, uh, after that, a direct perfluorocarbon silicon. I prefer silicon oil exchange in doing free flaps and autologous grafts because I don't want to lose these flaps. Once I do a fluid air exchange, they can float again and you, and you uh, uh, lose the, these flaps. So this is uh, the uh, post-operative uh, OCT. Uh, finally, this is a patient that is here with, uh, that had recurrent detachment and had two macular breaks. Again, this patient uh, had PVR. I had uh, to remove subretinal bands and I do inferior retinectomy. Again, I took a piece of retina and used it as a, 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 an autologous graft for, for, the, for the break. This is the post-operative process. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, closure of uh, non-conventional breaks require non-conventional solutions. Tissue grafts, whether it's ILM or uh, retinal autologous grafts or even uh, uh, amniotic membrane grafts, apparently can work uh, not just in macular holes but in other uh, non-macular breaks and further studies are needed to show effective efficacy in non-macular breaks. And again, I extend the invitation for the, um, uh, the upcoming EGFRS meeting that will be held uh, at the Mena House Marriott 
uh, from the 10th of April 2019. And I welcome you to, to join us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Sharif, um, for this elegant presentation. And now, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Samir Al Baha, again from Alexandria University, and is going to speak about autologous transplantation of RPE and croidal free grafts. Dr. Samir. Uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, good afternoon. My topic will be about the autologous transplantation of the RPE and choroidal retinal graft. As we know, there are different modalities of management of choroidal neovascular membrane, starting from submacular hemorrhage uh, by using the anti-VEGF or through medium submacular hemorrhage by different modalities, starting by anti-VEGF injection, as with TPA, surgical removal with or without TPA. But in cases of, of huge uh, choroidal neovascular membrane, we have two options, either submacular surgery or macular translocation. Uh, Here's a case with extensive submacular uh, choroidal neovascular membrane and the hemorrhage, sorry. Uh, I'm doing uh, this time surgical removal of the submacular membrane after doing uh, temporal uh, retinotum, as you can see, you can remove this membrane with the end gripping force, and this is an organized hemorrhage. As you can see, it is, there is an extensive uh, choroidal neovascular membrane, but unfortunately, this is associated with great damage of the retinal pigment epithelium, so we expect that visual outcome is very poor. For this reason, we are promoting the autologous transplantation of RP and choroidal uh, free graft. It was first proposed by Feynman in 1991, and uh, my case is 67 years old. The female, one-eyed, visual act around uh, counting finger 50 centimeter with this huge fibrotic choroidal and vascular membrane. Uh, my procedure is to remove this membrane and to do a choroidal patch uh, graft. Usually we start by doing uh, vitrectomy as usual. I'm using the 23G system. And I like to use uh, twin light, it helps me for better illumination. And I start by detachment of the sensory retina using 41G cannula. You should do more than area of, in, of uh, separation uh, to have a proper detachment. After that, we start by doing a fluid air exchange to push the fluid which is present in the periphery to reach the central area. This is followed by temporal uh, retinotomy using the diathermy, flipping uh, the retina upside down, and to go behind the retina or underneath the retina, we have to use perfluorocarbon. There is no any harm from injecting perfluorocarbon under the retina. Then we start the dissection of this uh, fibrotic uh, uh, choroidal neovascular membrane, as you can see, using the end gripping forceps, and start to separate it. Sometimes there is a uh, blood vessel coming from the choroid to other vessels, you can do the thermi for this uh, blood vessel. Should be very cautious during removal of this membrane. After complete removal, we start to harvest the choroid, choroidal patch, I mean. Usually I'm doing it in the upper temporal uh, part as briefly as possible, using the endolaser to delineate this area and uh, after that, we use diathermy to avoid any bleeding from the choroidal vessels. And with the vertical scissors, we start to separate this uh, patch of choroid from the surrounding choroid until it is completely separated. As you can see, that there is a sclera behind the patch of the choroid. And we start to drag this choroidal patch very slowly to till it reaches its final destination where the fovea should be, and we have to spread it. During this transportation, it is, we, we should not uh, flip this patch upside down. It's very important, and you, sh you should uh, strip it, uh, sorry, uh, spread it over the area, very smoothly, either with the forceps or with the can of scrapper. Then start to push the retina back, I have to remove the perfluorocarbon from underneath the retina with active suction or with the cutter. It should be very slowly, and you should aspirate it away from the choroidal patch to avoid moving of the patch from its 
place. Actually, it doesn't move from its place because the choroid is, 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 is rough. The undersurface is rough. It is not smooth. So it don't, doesn't move. Uh, then it starts the injection of uh, fluorocarbon inside over the, as you can see, this is the choroidal uh, graft in its place and the laser photocoagulation for the retinotomy. This is followed by silicon fluorocarbon exchange. Here is the case post-operative, as you can see, this is the, the uh, reflections of the silicon. Uh, the post-operative visual activity was 20 over 200 after three months of surgery. What are the indications of choroidal patch graft? It is end, in, in cases of end stage exertive AMD, in cases of failure of, this, uh, of other strategies, patient doesn't have other surgical options. Why the choroidal patch is, is uh, excision of the sub retinal membrane didn't result in visual improvement due to damage of the outer retinal layer, and you are using pure fluorocarbon, no need from. But perfusion of the graft is crucial for reorganization uh, of the choroidal uh, vessels and connection of the choroidal blood vessels of the choroid with the underlying uh, choroid. And uh, perfusion usually starts from one week to three uh, weeks, as you can see. This part, okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you for your attention. for this um, elegant presentation. And the next speaker is Dr. Ashraf Shaharawi, again from Alexandria University. Comparative study between wide angle viewing system, Eckerd twin light chandelier into illuminator and indirect ophthalmoscope in management of conventional retinal detachment, pigmentogenous retinal detachment. Uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure this afternoon to be sharing in the Vital Retinal Society of India as a part of the EGBRS. My talk is about comparison between the chandelier assisted buckling versus the traditional indirect ophthalmoscopy buckling. And I call it back to the future. Because of this technique, we are more using buckling uh, uh, indications than previously. And this is an example of a case in which we use the chandelier assisted buckling, localization of the retinal break, cryo application on the break, drainage of the subretinal fluid, flattening of the retina. Again, this is the video uh, demonstration of the case. As you can see, you have a very wide viewing area of the retina, very easily to uh, depress the peripheral retina uh, by yourself because you have a chandelier inside the eye. Again, this is pseudophagic patient, and it has whitened the indication for convention and buckling in uh, uh, pseudophagic patient because previously we had been us using uh, uh, vitrectomy in most cases of uh, pseudophagic patients. Again, after application of the cry treatment of the break, we screened the peripheral retina in just one second and then placed number 41 uh, band around the, the break, drained the subretinal fluid, and now, as you can see, you can easily see that the break is on the buckle just by sphere depression and you screen the rest of the retina and be sure that you don't have any missed breaks. This was the post-operative appearance of the patient one week with air inside the vitreous cavity, one month following surgery with flattening of the retina, and as you can see, the eye is very quiet. Another case with a single break in protemporary, and as you can see, there's some vitreous changes, so it's graded as PBR grade A, and in spite of that, we didn't go for, vit for vitrectomy. We just uh, applied a local buckle to the area of the break because it was a single break, and we are sure through the chandelier system we don't get missed breaks. And this was the post-operative appearance. Again, this uh, teaching system of chandelier-assisted buckling had proved the previous Linkoff uh, uh, series of localization of the retinal break in such a supratemporal Detachments, we can find the break within one and a half hour of the superior part of the detachment. Again, very good sphere depression by yourself and not by the assistant, and drainage of the subretinal fluid, the break on the buckle, and you are sure that you have flattened the retina, and you are sure that you have a successful uh, surgery. Another indication is to look for the secondary break. In spite of that, that this is the primary break, and we had found it in the primary part of the surgery, 
it's very easy to clean the rest of the retina without the tiredness of looking and leaning forward with the indirect ophthalmoscope uh, just above your hand. Again, there are some minute observation we didn't see it before with the indirect ophthalmoscope because of the minified view and uh, the narrow field of the white of the indirect ophthalmoscope, which is retinal infiltration. As you can see, as the retina is flattened and the buckle is clean, there was a minute fold appearing on the laser side at the side of the drainage. And in spite of the appearance, very good appearance of incarceration of the retina into the side of the drainage, we didn't do anything more. Why? Because the, this incarceration site was resting on the buckle. So we don't have, and the patient passed postoperatively very nicely. Again, other cases of successful upper nasal retinal detachment, inferior retinal detachment, postoperative appearance with this technique of chandelier. We can get sub macular hemorrhage during the drainage, but this is not cited only to the chandelier assisted buckling, but it can happen with any drainage procedure, with any conventional uh, detachment, but the hemorrhage usually absorbed in spite of the fact that some cases are replaced by retinal pigment epithelial proliferation, which affect the visual outcome. Again, successful cases, high buckles can occur if you tighten the buckle uh, during hypotony of the eye before reformation of the globe using air or gas. In conclusion, twin light assisted scare buckling or chandelier assisted buckling for primary retinal attachment is a better alternative to classic surgery with the indirect ophthalmoscopy. And we are back to the future. With this newer technique, we have many advances over the traditional ones, such as clear direct retinal image that can be enlarged and sharply focused even with small pupil. Easier detection of small retinal break, especially in pseudophagic, which is very characteristic, having very small flap tears at the vitreous base. And every part of the retina in micron can be examined. We don't get any missed breaks. Even with the presence of media opacity, like corneal opacity or faint nebula, you can go ahead through the biome or the site and do your conventional retinal detachment. Better illumination, wider angle of viewing, ease for the op operation, for the surgeon, saving his neck and back. And it's a perfect teaching tool. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. And um, now it's uh, Dr. Amr Azab, protractomy as a primary management of diabetic macular edema. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, I should thank again the uh, Veterinary Society of India for me in particular for the generous uh, invitation and for being here for the first time, and I promise it will not be the last time. I'll bring my family in the coming year, uh, I hope so. Today, I'm not giving a new technique. I'm just revisiting an old established technique that's doing vitrectomy as a primary procedure for cases of diabetic macular edema who didn't ever have any sort of treatment before. Diabetic macular edema, of course, we know the options of treatment is now uh, only uh, the very well uh, established and the gold standard is the anti -vegif. It used uh, to be uh, said that vitrectomy is a hazardous procedure we cannot uh, do vitrectomy as a primary procedure. This comes from the diabetic vitrectomy study, which was in an era where the instrumentation was not so good, the visualization is not so good. Nowadays, if we think about vitrectomy as a hazardous procedure, it is not any more hazardous more than injection. The incidence of retinal detachment is not more than 1%. This equal to the incidence of endophthalmitis following injections. So the hazard is minimal. Why the vitrectomy has this bad reputation? Because there is a fear of there is no improvement of vision because it used to be uh, applied to cases where the resistant macular edema who have failed the other modalities of treatment where there is a fear that 
injecting anti-VEGF following the vitrectomy will not work. This also proven not to be true. So we conducted uh, 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 the study after doing some cases like this one, where you have a vitromacular traction. This is the usual case that we all do and the repeated injections, there is no improvement. We go to vitrectomy as a last resort. Yes, we achieve anatomical improvement, but no visual improvement. This is not justice, because this is a nor, not a fair comparison with the anti -vegif. Why not to use vitrectomy in primary cases where there is no vitromacular traction, where uh, there is no other uh, modalities of treatment have been tried and failed? So we conducted this trial uh, starting from 2015, and we conducted in 20 eyes. The inclusion criteria was, uh, uh, as usual, diabetic macular edema with central macular sickness above 300. The ex exclusion was vetromacular traction, cases with proliferative di diabetic retinopathy, cases with previous surgeries, or uh, cases uh, with cataract not to be humbled by the possibility of Irving gas. And we didn't use steroids intraocular, no endolaser, and no periocular steroids was used. We were only testing the vitrectomy. You, during the, the, the operation, of course, so I used to do, uh, use uh, the, uh, the triamis alone. Sorry. So I used to do the trimis alone to verify that I removed all the vitreous. The film is not working, but it showed the, the regular ILM billing that I repeated the uh, fluid air exchange several times to make sure that I removed all the vitreous because I didn't use uh, trimis alone during the operation. At six months, 19 cases, like 95% shows uh, decreased in central macular sickness. 80% of the cases showed improvement in the best corrected visual acuity. I'll share with you some of the cases. This is case number one. We started with the best corrected visual acuity of 660 and uh, preoperative OCT thickness is uh, 857. This is after six months. The center uh, foveal thickness is 338 and the vision improved to 624. And this now, after three years, still the retina is detergent no recurrence of the edema, and the visual acuity is stable. This is another case with preoperative visual acuity of three over 60. Fake patient, preoperative OCT is 605. And this is the post-operative, 624, and the central macular sickness is 330. Again, this is after three years. Macula is still dry, and the vision is stable. Single procedure, not repeated injections. Case three, this is a case of foveal, with foveal exodus. The central foveal sickness was 421, and best corrected vision was 660. This is after six months, the exodus is gone, and the retina is stable, and this two and a half years old, uh, later. Is the procedure uh, without uh, complications? There was a one case of iatrogenic break, which was laced during the operation, and in this case, we, which uh, developed cataract post-operative and we have to do cataract surgery. The patient developed uh, a recurrent edema, most probably as a form of Irving S syndrome. And this patient improved a lot with only one injection of trimethylone and again, it is stable. So in conclusion, in the era of small gauge vitrectomy, we have to reevaluate pars plana vitrectomy in the treatment of diabetic macular edema. It may be appropriate first line of treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amr. And now, Dr. Hani Hamza, a ciliary melanoma from resection to reconstruction. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Changing the theme to oncology, uh, this case was done in 2015, the resection of the tumor. It's a male patient, 56 years old, with accidental discovery of an iridociliary mass on routine examination. The mass was distorting the pupil and invading the angle of the anterior chamber. UBM, ultrasonography, and systemic workup were done. And this is the UBM picture. As you can see, the mass originates in the ciliary body, invades the angle of the anterior chamber and the iris as well and it has a diameter of 4.2 times 2.5 millimeters. 
So my decision at that time was to do an iridocyclectomy and application of a ruthenium plug. And this is the procedure, as you can see. After uh, applying traction sutures on the muscles, you make the initial incision, which is one millimeter around the tumor with a safety margin. And then you do a lamellar scleral dissection, two thirds of the sclera, and extending this dissection anteriorly till you reach the clear cornea. Then you apply a, an MDR incision and a radial iridotomy, externalizing the pupillary border on either side. You open the incision and you excise the iris angle and ciliary body in one mass, as you can see. You cannot grasp the tumor, but you use the deep sclera actually as a handle to elevate the tumor and remove it completely with the safety margin. You have some bleeding in the anterior chamber. The patient is phakic, but simply by injecting viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, this bleeding comes out. You close the wound tightly, and at the end, you apply a ruthenium radioactive plug, as you will see in a moment. And of course, the ruthenium radioactive plug uh, overlaps the cornea, but you have a one millimeter of inactive radiation around the border, so it's not harming the cornea at all. After five years of follow-up this year, the patient developed cataract, subluxated lens, and a large iris defect causing glare. And this is the UBM after five years showing the huge iris defect, but there is no recurrence of the tumor at all. So my decision was to do a FACO, IOL, and iris prothesis using the human optics uh, iris prothesis. So this is the appearance at the time of the cataract surgery. You have a subluxated lens with absence of mule at the area of the resection, which is temporal. And you do the capsulorexis, which was a bit difficult because of the uh, zonular dialysis. Then you do a regular FACO surgery and remove the lens completely. And after you remove the lens matter, fortunately the lens was soft, it was not hard, and then you inflate the bag with a viscoelastic. You can see the area of subluxation. You put a capsule tension ring in this part to distend the capsular bag and support the lens and the iris prothesis that's going to be inserted later, as you can see. This is insertion of the capsule tension ring inside the capsular bag and centralizing it in the capsular bag, as you can see. And then I'm putting the three-piece IOL, it's a sensor IOL. And next, I start preparing the iris prosthesis, which is the important part. I use a large special prefine, which is 11 millimeter, and the diameter of the prosthesis should be 0.5 millimeter less than the white to white. After excising it, you have to also to do an iridectomy to allow an aqueous circulation. And then you fold the iris prosthesis and insert it inside the eye, and you have to put the iris prosthesis posterior to the iris, in the posterior chamber. This prosthesis is not designed at all to be put in the anterior chamber. So you unfold it using a push-pull hook after inserting it inside the eye, and you tuck it behind the nasal iris, which is still remaining. Of course, there is some color difference because this uh, human optic iris prosthesis has a standard brown color, and this is the final picture after uh, unfolding the iris prosthesis and you close the wound completely. Post-operatively, the patient, I saw him two weeks ago, he has a best corrected vision of 0 0.3. He has a mild PCO pending for a YAG capsulotomy. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Haney. And now um, we are waiting for your questions and comments. Um, so anyone who would like to ask question or um, comment on the presentation would come to the microphone, please. Uh, so excellent uh, videos, a lot of learning, the last case by Dr. Hamza. Uh, but my question is to Dr. Mbabi. Uh, Dr. Mbabi showed uh, the autologous retinal transplantation uh, to the break near the disc. And uh, I was just wondering if instead of the long drag under the PFCL, is there a way to reduce the travel from far peripheral? So maybe reduce the LPFC bubble and make it stop. Well, the, the problem, with once you harvest the graft, which I usually prefer to take it from as far peripheral as possible, not so far peripheral, at least anterior to the equator. So if you have the eye uh, fluid filled, okay, and you try to take the graft with a forceps, 
put it right on the macula. Sometimes it sticks to the forceps and you get into trouble going, kind of losing it out of the forceps and you take a lot, a lot of time. So after trying several attempts with different techniques, I found that the, the best way is to just slide it under the pectoral carbon. The, that's the, um, the easiest way. And then you just swipe it uh, gently up to, to the macula. Otherwise, it will keep uh, uh, adherent to whatever uh, instrument you're using, whether it's a, a, a scra diamond dust scraper or it is a forceps. Uh, so usually it's not easy to dislodge it. from. So the best way is to just take it from the peripheral part of the bubble of the pectoral carbon and just take it down to the macula. Now, the challenge for th those cases is not just the travel, because in high myopic patients, unlike normal eyes, in the posterior staphyloma, there is no pigment. So sometimes you sometimes can lose vision of the graft because of the transparency of the graft and also there is no contrast. So that's why once you, grab, once you have it, you have to go all the way in one swipe. Otherwise, if you stop and you just go away from it, you might lose it. You cannot see it. Uh, Sharif, you may also lose the position of the macular hole. Yes. Because of the loss, loss of the exactly. Is there any tricks you do? So usually I, I look for a landmark so that I know which vessel is there so that I can put the graft right. And then I increase my magnification to see clearly. But sometimes visibility is an issue as well. Okay. Uh, Professor uh, Mortada, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for their wonderful presentation. I have a question for you. you your technique is a 360 degree of uh, ION peeling and you have multiple threads, but it's, uh, it's not uh, detached and you free over to the hole. And uh, so I'm, my question is, so in that hole you have multiple layer of ION piling up together. So is it possible that we can only do, let's say 180 degree, just half? We don't need to do multiple, we don't need to do in circle in 360 uh, degrees of, uh, of the ION uh, inversion. What, what's your comment on this? Uh, good, qu good question, but um, um, if we look into the literature and uh, look into the uh, results of uh, Jersey, he has some flaps that become reinverted or the flap is lost. So he had to go again inside the eye and reoperate or find another graft or reposition the graft. So by having these flaps over and not inside the macular hole, then you are sure that the ILM is placed over the hole and there is no uh, chance for these flaps to become re-everted. So I think um, it is a way and it is uh, uh, also a way of removing the internal limiting membrane from the area over the posterior staphyloma. And this is the difference between this technique and other similar techniques because we remove the ILM over the posterior staphyloma to the edge of the staphyloma. And this is in order to decrease the, uh, or eliminate the rigidity of the internal limiting membrane and allow the posterior, ret the, the, the posterior retina to conform to the concavity of this large, huge posterior staphyloma. So it is a way of ensuring putting the flap and another and uh, more important is to eliminate the rigid ILM from this area. So you, 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 what you are saying is that these ILM threads, they're actually interlocking to each other so they could secure yes. uh, their position. Exactly, exactly. Okay. We do not know how the ILM flaps um, work, but um, in all cases where you can place a flap or flaps over the macular hole, we have closure of the macular hole in f uh, closure and the retina is attached with the use of air and not silicon oil, except in very difficult cases. Thank you. So I have a question to Dr. Shamir Alwa. Shamir. Regarding the choroidal graft, subretinal choroidal graft in macular scar area, yes. scar area you have removed that scar. Yes. But along with the scar, you have removed some retinal tissue also. That means the inner layer and the visual cells are also lo lost, I think so. So whenever you have placed the graft, what was the result 
of those graphs, whether the graphs were stable in that place only, whether that shifted to the paramophobial region or not, what was the result? That was my, my question. Okay. Uh, in, 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 the in this procedure, usually you, you are uh, elevating the retina if there is a line between, or there is uh, an area of the section between the retina and, the, and this membrane. So you don't damage the outer retinal layers. What is damaged actually is the uh, retinal pigment epithelium, okay? For this reason, I'm, remo I'm moving the choroid and, the, and the, the retinal pigment epithelium in its place. But the other, definitely there is some damage in the photoreceptors, okay? But the results of this technique depends on many things. F uh, first of all, the starting visual activity, the better the visual activity will be, the, the better results, the, the age of the patient. The younger the patient, you have a better results. And the size of the graft, it should be at least three disc diameters to have an excellent result. And there is a study published in 2012 uh, on 130 cases, not by me, but in the US. And they published that one patient had uh, vision 20 over 30, 5% of the patient have vision better than 20, 40, and 5% of the patient has uh, vision better than 20 over 200. So the result is uh, promising. And we are using this technique only in the, in the end stage case, as you can see, it is uh, no other hope for this lady. So, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Samir, I have a question for you. Uh, we noticed that uh, the presence of scar tissue around the drops, and uh, is there any way to decrease the amount of this fibrous tissue and gliosis around the, the you mean graft? Before, you mean no, no, uh, after, after, after there is a ring of fibrous tissue yeah, around. Yeah. Is there a way to decrease? The, the only way is to make the graft larger than that. But we actually, we, we want to save the central area so we can have some vision. So uh, we, well, we uh, cannot remove all yeah, this. It uh, is suggested that to have the graft from a very distant place in the fundus so that this may, may help to decrease the amount of scarring around the uh, graft. But um, uh, perfect technique. Uh, yes? My, yes. My question also goes to Dr. Samir Ulbaha. That uh, to I have whom? also done, uh, to Dr. Samir yes. Ulbaha. Yes. Yes. And uh, I have also done autologous RP uh, choroid transplant, free graft transplant in a couple of cases. Yes. Uh, How do you think thing about your, the, the, one the, the question is, like, uh, what is your experience regarding the chronic hypotony postoperatively? Number one. Number two, can you repeat? Can you repeat? Post-operative chronic hypotony. Post-operative chronic hypotony after doing autologous choreo, uh, yeah. choreo, RP choroid transplantation. Yeah. Number two, in case of submacular scar, when uh, what is your experience regarding the like additions between the neurosensory retina and the scar tissue? Scar tissue. You are removing the scar, submacular scar. Uh, like what is the like? Uh, like is there uh, there in many cases, scar tissue is attached to the neurosensory retina. So if you are injecting the BSS with the 41 gauge needle uh, at the posterior pole, then you can judge that the situation, whether it is going to separate, the scar tissue can be separated from the neurosensory retina or not. Otherwise, it can ruin the removal, it can create the break also. Actually, yes. actually I did uh, six cases, and uh, none of the cases, only one, I have a hypotony. I'm keeping the silicone inside. I couldn't remove it because I removed it, it will go fourth crisis. So I'm yes. keeping the silicone if I have a hypotony. The second, the perfluorocarbon actually helped me a lot to dissect this, uh, uh, the retina from the underlying membrane. But I didn't have this firm adhesion between the retina and this uh, uh, scar or this uh, membrane. Okay. So um, can we have the question from the, do you want to ask question? Yes. yes. I have a question for Dr. Azab. Azab. So you have shown excellent results uh, with ILM peeling and dietary macular edema. So my, I have two questions. The first one is, what's the mechanism that's keeping this macular edema away for so long? What do you propose? And the second question is, after such excellent results, now have you started doing this as the only procedure? Have you stopped injecting and doing focal lasers? Uh, first question is, uh, why the postulation that this edema have gone for this long time yeah. 
the postulation is, uh, have been written uh, many times in literature that there is a better oxygenation of the retina, there is uh, removal of the scaffold that uh, uh, aberretinal membranes used to st uh, stretch the retina uh, at this area. Uh, so removal of the ILM didn't allow any aberretinal proliferations. There is better uh, uh, getting rid of uh, uh, the VEGF, but it's all postulations, but actually it worked. It worked for three years as you have uh, seen. Uh, the other part of the question I didn't. Uh, now, now are you doing this routinely? Have you stopped do injecting and doing focal lasers? Uh, I use this actually this technique in uh, many patients who uh, are f uh, cannot afford repeated injections. So I give them uh, two options. We have uh, a validated option that giving the anti vegf repeatedly will dry your retina or we can try this technique which is you will pay once and it has a, a, a good chance of success. Who accept uh, wh which, which I, I choose. We need actually a very large randomized study, multi-center study. I think there was one going on in the United States by Dr. Stewart to have a very good uh, talk about it. And we wait for the results in order to change our minds from giving anti for each patient to try this uh, technique. Uh, sir, um, I have a question for Dr. Samir and for Dr. Hani Hamza. So, Dr. Samir, you know that uh, how to choose the place of the graft, whether it should be superior or inferior or at the horizontal, because as you know, humans are terrestrial beings, so we need the inferior visual field for walking. So in case you are harboring the graph from the superior area, you're creating a visual field defect inferiorly. And if you're, create, if you're g gathering it from inferiorly, the superior visual field laws may not be that yeah. much a practical problem. So any comments yeah. on that? I, I understand your, your, your question, but uh, you know you, can, you can't gain everything. You can't have everything in your hands. But okay. in, my, in my hands, I feel it is much easier to do it in the superior temporal part. But, but your idea is, is right. But, uh, and, and, and you have to have a good graph to, to be successful, so at, to be at least three, di three disc diameters. Thank you. So Dr. Hamza, uh, we, the, in India we have experience with using the Aneridia IOL, which is a scleral fixated dioptric lens with a pigmented periphery and the you clear center. The, the, one the, the problem with that is, it's a PMM lens, the problem with that is leaching. It loses pigment over time. Do you see such a problem with the iris prosthesis that you use? Well, I have used up till now four iris prosthesis in different indications. And actually it's <coughs> very uh, biocompatible, well tolerated, you don't get glaucoma, you don't get uveitis. And it's uh, really the one of human optics I really recommend. And they have two types, the polyfiber type, which is thicker, and a thinner one, which I do not recommend to use. The polyfiber one, you can sometimes even use, uh, use it in absence of a capsular support. You just put the IOL inside it and put a scleral tunnel IOL so that the whole complex is fixed to the sclera. So I would recommend this one. It's very biocompatible and very well tolerated by the eye. Which company is making them, sir? Which company is making these iris it's prosthesis? Uh, human Optics. Human Optics, it's a German company, and they have two types. The, the standard type, which is the brown one I have shown to you, and if your patient, this costs about 1,900 euro, and they give you two pieces, so okay. that in case one is damaged or uh, so, you can use the other one. Okay. But if you want to have it custom made, you can take a photo of the other eye of the patient, send it to the company and they manufacture it exactly the same iris color as the other eye. But this one costs 4,000 euros. So it needs a okay. uh, more rich patient and doctor as well. Thank Last you. question. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Amar Azad, uh, in your series of cases where you did the primary vitrectomy DME, did you make any differentiation between the cases like diffuse DME, focal DME, or what was the severity of as such diabetic retinopathy in these cases? Uh, conducting this study, we 
choose not to be biased by the preoperative condition of the macula. We, we used the technique for each and every patient who, has, uh, who is naive, diabetic macular edema, who didn't receive any treatment. Of course, as we all know, the cases where the, uh, uh, we know the biomarkers in the OCT, which give the good prognosis, uh, the improved in the vision. But those who, uh, the biomarkers are not good, they improved all anatomically improved, but those with the biomarkers like the ellipsoid zone is absent or there is a, a severe cystoid edema, they improved anatomically, but not uh, visually. Okay, I think our time is over and we would like to thank you for attending our symposium. And I uh, would like again to thank the Vit Retina Society of India for um, the generous invitation and uh, hospitality. And um, I hope to see you all in Cairo in April um, at our international meeting next April. Thank you very much. Thank you.